The title for our lesson today comes from the Ten Commandments. It's the first three words of the Fifth Commandment. Honor your father. Our first point is, honor your earthly father. Let's turn to Mark chapter 7. Verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who'd come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews who don't eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplaces, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why do your disciples live according to the traditions of why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it's written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise receive from me is Corban, that is a gift devoted to God, then you are no longer to let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Right here, seemingly the issue becomes the fact that the disciples of Jesus did not wash their hands before they ate. Now, moms, you need to understand it's not a command in the Word of God that the kids have to wash their hands. On the other hand, it is a good idea. Amen, church? But Jesus used this situation right here to point out the hypocrisy in the Pharisees who were so hung up with the tradition that they needed to wash their hands in the ceremonial washing, but they refused to honor God with their lives. He says, you honor God with your lips, but not with your lives. And then Jesus talked about the fifth commandment. He says, you know that it's written, you are to honor your father and your mother. And he says, but what you've done is you have only made this a command by your traditions to be filled by lip service. You say, hey, if you give a small gift devoted to God to the temple, then that's in substitute of honoring your father and your mother. But what Jesus meant by that was to really honor your father and your mother meant that whatever trial, whatever tribulation, particularly as they got old, you would pay any expense to make sure that all of their needs were met. Amen, church? You know, I'm very, very, very fortunate that uh, I had a great dad that I was raised by. And uh, my dad really was one of my heroes growing on up. He served in the United States Navy, and he eventually reached the rank of a two-star admiral, like a two-star general. And uh, his last tour of duty was as operations general for the entire U.S. Medical and Dental Corps. In other words, he was in charge of all the hospitals and ships around the world of the U.S. Navy. And uh, he served in some difficult situations, uh, most, uh, most well-known, of course, is Vietnam. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is that even though Dad was gone many times because of, of sea duty, he still was extremely devoted to the family. I mean, this year, my parents get to be celebrating their 57th wedding anniversary. And uh, one of the things that I, I super appreciate about my dad is, is that, that he has a real heart for his family. We have a little bit of an unusual situation in my family where both of my parents were single kids. And so on one side, Grandpa and Grammy, they just had dad, and Grandpa and Grandma just had mom. And so they were the only children to take care of their mom and their dad. Well, uh, my uh, grandparents used to live in Indiana and they moved down to Florida. But when it came time for my dad and mom to retire, Though they really love San Diego, and who wouldn't love San Diego? They said, you know something? Our parents are in Florida, 
and they're getting older. And so that's where we're going to go and retire. They went down there and my parents lived, grandparents lived a long time. Three of them lived to their mid eighties and grandma lived till she was 92. And I hope that jeans comes on down there, you know, a little bit. But the incredible thing is, is that, and, and my mom's from the Midwest, and the Midwestern people have a way of talking. You can ask the Kirshners about that. And when a person ages, they, they, they use a, an expression, they say, oh, he's really failed. And so the expression was, well, when my grandparents or their parents were in failing health, when they were really failing, mom and dad were there. They not only talked to grandpa and grandma and grampy and grammy, every day, but they visited them almost every day. They took care of my grandparents, each one of them, to the very end. Not only did mom and dad have that kind of a heart, but about a year and a half ago, my little sister, who's 10 years younger than me, her husband had a major stroke, Bob. And it was a tragic situation because Dana and Bob were totally financially unprepared for this catastrophic situation. Well, once more, mom and dad come in. They not only have been paying for my sister's mortgage, not only have they been paying for a lot of other bills, but they're also helping uh, Dana's youngest daughter go to college. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's an incredible example to me of how people need to honor their family. And, you know, dad, being an admiral, was a no-mess-around type guy. Now, with mom, if I needed to go someplace or I wanted to do something, I'd always go ask mom because there was a lot higher percentage chance of a yes on that. <laughs> but with dad, things were either right or they were wrong, and there were no excuses. You know what I'm talking about right there? Yeah, I mean, even, even, I'll never, never, ever forget my, my senior year. I was watching TV, and my mom wanted me to empty the garbage. And she kept asking me and asking me and asking. And finally, I was just so upset. I just said some extremely disrespectful words to my mom. And I said it really loud. I didn't think my dad was in the house. All of a sudden, I hear my dad coming down the steps. I go, oh, I just, I just froze there in the kitchen. Dad comes in. He goes, what did you say? And he goes, Whoosh. Just smack me across the face. That was in the 60s. It was okay to hit your kid in the 60s, you know. <laughs> he said, listen, and I'll never forget this. She may be your mother, but she's my wife, and you will never talk to her like that again. Yes, sir. And I, I, I never did talk like that to my mother again in my father's presence. But you know, my dad's hardlineness was God's way of preparing me for some of the most traumatic times in my life as a Christian. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews 12, verse 7, because of the way I was raised by my dad, I understood this scripture even before I read it. It says in verse 7, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're illegitimate children, not true sons. Moreover, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. I firmly believe that when I got disciplined by my dad, he was trying to make me into be a better person. I mean, I still remember, son, get your elbows off the table. Son, stop slouching. Son, <laughs> it's just on me. But, you know, in retrospect, I go, wow, I really appreciate that. Yeah. You know, I was taught to say, yes, sir. No, ma'am. There was respect that was taught. Right. And this scripture teaches us that 
those of us that had good fathers, we understand that our earthly fathers did the best they could. Sometimes they messed up some. But God is our perfect heavenly father. And we need to understand that he's totally sovereign. So whenever we have hardship come into our lives as either non-Christians or Christians, we need to have a deep conviction that God is sovereign. And so he either has made this happen or he's allowed it to happen. For what purpose? So that we will become holy and righteous. That's the purpose for the hard times. Often we go through hard times and we're very people focused. And we're wondering, why did this person hurt me? Why did this person do that? And we become bitter. You need to stop and say, what is God trying to teach me right here? Amen? Amen. You know, that example from my dad and even the scriptures right here helped me in trying to raise my kids. And I have three incredible kids. Uh, For those that don't know their names, it's Olivia, Sean, and Eric. They're about two years apart each of them. And uh, Olivia and Sean, I mean, they were just cranking straight-A students. And then came Eric. (laughs) He was the fun kid. He was the laid-back kid. He was the kid who could do anything but homework. (laughs) I still remember getting a call at the end of third grade from his teacher. He says, you know, Mr. McKean, your son hasn't turned in homework. He hasn't done anything. He's been lying. And I'm going... I can't believe it. They flunked him. My kid flunked third grade. So we had to have a little talking. Actually, it was a little bit more than a talking. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Remember that scripture? I didn't want Eric to be spoiled. Let's just say that. And then came a discipline that he hated. Summer school. Oh, dad, no. Yes, we're going to summer school. Because we're going to repeat third grade and we're going to do good. And yes, you're going to have a tutor every Monday night. And daddy is going to be helping you with your homework. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Amen. (laughs) At the end of the third grade, the second time, straight A's. Fourth grade, straight A's. Fifth grade, straight A's. All the way through high school, one B. The kid that flunked third grade got into Harvard, turned him down, and went to Stanford. (laughs) And I was really touched the day he graduated from from Stanford. They they, they give their, I don't know what they call these things, exactly what hangs around their neck at their graduation. And they're supposed to give it to the person that helped them the most to get in or during those years. And Eric gave it to me. He says, Dad, I'd have never learned how to be a hard worker if you hadn't done what you did back in third grade. They remember. And though no discipline seems pleasant at the time, its goal is a harvest of peace and righteousness. And so today, we need to set our minds to honor our earthly fathers. Amen? Amen. Secondly, we need to honor our adoptive and our stepfathers. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 1. Some individuals, in the sovereignty of God, were not raised by their earthly fathers, but by stepfathers or by adoptive fathers. One such individual was Jesus. Let's read about it. Matthew 1, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be a child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had no mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fill, fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. You know, right here, 
we have some very important lessons that we learn. First of all, a lot of people don't understand the marriage tradition of the Jews in that day. They were, quote, officially engaged, or they would say pledged to be married, and then one year later, the actual ceremony took place, and at that time, then, the wife would go home with the husband. But during this period of time was when Mary conceived Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And so Joseph, knowing that he hadn't laid a hand on Mary, goes, man, she's been messing around with another guy. She just needs to be put away quietly. She needs to be divorced. Because technically, in the eyes of the Jews, they were married, though they weren't together at this point. Well, God intercedes and says, hey, Joseph, this is from the Holy Spirit. You need to take that woman home and protect her and take care of her. And so he takes her into the house at that time and protects her from public disgrace. And the Bible says that they had no union, they had no sex until Jesus was born. So we find a few things out right here. Number one, that God was protecting Mary and protecting Jesus from public disgrace. Secondly, though, we also come to understand here that Mary was not a perpetual virgin as some religions teach. Turn to Mark chapter 6. In Mark 6 verse 1 it says, Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that's been given him that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Well, right here, we learn that uh, no prophet is honored in his hometown. Amen, guys? But we also see some interesting things. First of all, Jesus had several half-brothers and half-sisters. The brothers are named, the sisters are not. Secondly, we see the kind of profound influence that Jesus' dad, Joseph, had on him. We learn from Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, that Joseph was a carpenter. Jesus is called the son of a carpenter. Right here we find out that Jesus himself becomes a carpenter. He took on his dad's profession. Is that awesome right there? Shh. Now we know that Joseph had another dream. And when Jesus was a tiny little baby, he was told by God that he had to escape down to Egypt. And there they stayed for two years until God said it was safe to go back. And then we find that Jesus was 12 years old. Joseph was still alive because, remember, Mary and Joseph left Jesus in Jerusalem as they were heading on back home. You remember that story? So we see right here that Joseph had a profound impact on Jesus' life. He was picked by God to be his, so to speak, stepfather, if you see what I'm saying. And it's very interesting as I've, I've talked to people. On Wednesday night, this past Wednesday night, we had another incredible men's night out in the West region. Amen, guys? Yeah. And we talked about prayer, and, and I, so I was going around with the brothers, and I was trying to have some deeper conversations in the fellowship, and I talked to two of the brothers, and, and, I, and I found out from them that e they either came from a stepfather situation or from an adoptive father situation, and, and I just simply asked, well, how close are you? And there was a tremendous uncomfortability that I find with many people that have stepfathers or adoptive fathers. Because in our heart of hearts, we want things to be a certain way, and they're not. And there's a sting, and very often there's a bitterness that makes us pull back. And this one particular person, I said, well, how long have you been with this particular stepfather? I said, well, since I was two years old. Wow. Then he sacrificed all the years that essentially you were raised. And it's very interesting. He says, well, I don't call him dad. I just call him by his first name. I says, you know what would blow his mind? If you would call him and tell him that you love him and that you appreciate all the years that he took care of your mom and you. And, you know, we say, well, wow, that's, that's such a great challenge. Well, we need to understand this. Why is it so important for us to love our adoptive or stepfather. Well, the Bible says in John chapter 3 that Jesus was God's only begotten son. See, all the rest of us 
are adoptive sons and daughters of God. Amen, guys? And we need to love our adopted father. Amen? Amen. Let's move on. Point three. Honor your fathers in the gospel. Turn to Mark chapter 10. In Mark 10, we find the account of the rich young ruler coming up to Jesus and asking for eternal life. Jesus gives him some challenges, and the young man says, listen, I've kept all the commandments since I was a boy upward. And the Bible says that Jesus looked at him with love, and he says, well, then only one thing you lack. He says, go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. And the Bible says, the man's face fell, and he went away sad. Well, he wasn't the only one affected by that conversation because all the apostles are listening and they start going, well, then who then can be saved? And we pick up the action in verse 27. Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, "We, we left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters, mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecution, and in the age to come, eternal life. Well, right here, Jesus says, in order to follow me, you must be willing to give up everything you have, every relationship you have, everything that you are. you got to give up everything. But when you do that, you're going to be blessed a hundredfold in this life. That's pretty exciting. Amen, guys? Now, if you look very carefully at the text, he says, if you have to give up your home or your brother, sister, mother, or father or children or fields for me... Then you'll receive a hundred times back. But notice, Jesus says, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields. He leaves out fathers. Why? Because he wants us to understand we have one father in heaven. Amen? But we understand that in the church, we have a, a multitude of brothers and sisters, a multitude of mothers and fathers in the gospel. Why? Because God has provided inside the church to be our family. Turn to a couple scriptures. I've been studying the book of Psalms, and these really touch me. Psalm 34 is a powerful scripture about the heart of God. It says in verse 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Is that awesome? God is close to broken heart. So often when we're broken hearted, we feel that God's distant. Well, that's why we have the church to be reminded that there's a lot of people that want to take care of us when we get broken hearted. Look at Psalm 68. This is, this is really awesome. It says in verse six, God sets the lonely in families. Wow. You know, there are so many lonely people. When we were out serving the homeless yesterday, I mean, it, it, just, it just hurt to see so many hurting, lonely people. And as Nick noted, it wasn't like these people, at least in our minds, should have been people who were down and out. These were people that attended UCLA. These were people that had cranking jobs beforehand. They had just become totally despondent and brokenhearted and lonely, and this is where they ended up. Wow. But you know something? It's an amazing thing. Some of us can remain functional and still be brokenhearted and lonely. And that's one of the things God allows you to go through that to make you see your need for him. Certainly that draws a lot of us to God because the church is supposed to be a family. The number one thing that a church should be noted for is its love one for another. You know it's God's church when you see a group of disciples really loving one another. Amen, guys? But even inside the church, sometimes we can become lonely because God made us with a God vacuum. And we can even try to put church relationships in there. But if we're not doing strong with God, we can even be brokenhearted and lonely in the church. Amen, guys? But you know, God wants us to have a spiritual family. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Not 
Right here, Paul writes the church of Philippi. And he says in verse 19, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests and not of those of Christ Jesus. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. You see, even though Paul was not married, even though Paul had no physical kids, Paul had children. He had sons in the gospel. And why were they sons in the gospel? Because they worked together winning souls. There's nothing like working together, helping people. Is there? I mean, it's, it's an incredibly bonding thing. And the Bible says it's so powerful. Someone becomes a son. Read on, verse 25. But I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I'm all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him and the Lord with great joy, and honor men like him. Because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help that you could not give. You know, we live in a time where in many churches... There's been such an overreaction to the idolization of leaders that the words are only, I only follow Jesus, I just follow Jesus. Now, we only worship Jesus, amen, church? But if we're going to follow the Bible right here, it says that we are to honor those who laid down their lives for the service of Christ. He's talking about men right here and women, amen, sis? And we need to have a deep conviction that it's not optional that we honor men and women. We don't idolize them, but we need to be respectful and honor them. Are you with me right here? Now, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and this will give us a little bit better insight. You know, we've always looked at 1 Thessalonians as a Pauline letter. In other words, it's written by Paul, and so it is. But there's more to it. Look at verse 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy... To the church of Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Paul didn't just write this letter, but Silas and Timothy chipped in. Okay, well, what did this triumvirate, that's three guys, okay, what did this triumvirate have to say? We'll drop on down chapter 2. Verse 6. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you like a mother caring for little children. That's, that's a powerful image, isn't it, right there? I mean, when Lynn and I were vacationing, I mean, it was, just, it, was, it was so awesome. We got to see this one little duck family with all these little baby ducklings going. I mean, it's the cutest little thing. You see mom, you know, getting all the little ducklings right there. And, of course, we see it in, 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 in life. I mean, one of the most touching scenes is a mom taking care of her little kids, isn't it? Let's read on. He says, We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone. Well, I preach the gospel to you. And you are witnesses and so of God of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and his glory. Look at this. In writing this letter... Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they used the royal pronoun we. He says, yes, we were like a mom who cared a lot about you. But we were also like a dad who deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God. In other words, Timothy, who was a son in the gospel, now is a father in the gospel. You see, that's the order of life. Most people who become sons, most people become daughters. The sons in the next generation become fathers. And the daughters in the next generation become moms. That's the natural order of things 
physically, but it's the natural order of things spiritually. So, what have we learned so far? Well, number one, you need to have a father in the gospel. Someone that you want in your life because you respect them for how much they care about you, that they've shared their life with you, and yes, sometimes they're encouraging you, sometimes they're comforting you, and sometimes they're just flat discipling you, urging you. Amen? You know what I'm talking about right here? And we need to respect and honor those people. You know, as I was reflecting back on my own life, you know, I've been blessed with so many awesome spiritual dads, spiritual fathers. When I became a Christian at 17, college, the, uh, the, the minister at the church kind of took me underneath his wing. His name's Chuck Lucas. He baptized me and started training me for the ministry. He's my, like my first spiritual dad. Then when I got in the ministry, some other people helped me with my preaching. Not only Chuck, but a man named Marvin Phillips. He, he really helped me a lot on just trying to deliver an inspirational sermon. And then there was a brother named Richard Rogers. I mean, this guy could preach the word. And he knew his Bible so awesome. There was always something new that I was learning each time I heard him. There was another man named Roel Lemons in the Mainline Church. He used to have this, uh, really this magazine called Firm Foundation. And he would just lay it out to all the churches about the lukewarmness, the apathy, the racial prejudice, the lack of growth, and lack of missions. I'm going, wow, this guy cranked. He, he didn't care if people liked him or not. He was going to lay it out. Then I appreciated the, the elders in my life in the Boston years, uh, Paul McNeil, Al Baird, Bob Gimple. I mean, they helped me a lot with my, my young family. In L.A., in the L.A. years, there was Cecil Wooten. He helped with the administration. What an incredible man. He was a powerful man. And then, of course, you know about my spiritual grandfather, George Greganis. At 70 years old, he heads back to the mission field. Now, that's awesome. Amen, guys? That's awesome. And you know, the thing is, I, as, I, as I reflect, is that even now, I, I really feel like I've got other fathers. Now, they're physically younger than me, but they're fatherly in their influence. That's like Nick Bordieri, Tony Antelon, and yeah, Michael Kirshner is getting a hold of me too. <laughs> and even though these guys are younger, they give me fatherly advice. And they have aspects of their lives where they're more gifted than myself. They're more knowledgeable. God has trained them more. And I listen in a son-like way to these men. Because I know even at my age, I still need guidance and help. Amen? I mean, think about it. We all are at a unique place in our lives. We've never been here before. I've never been 55 before. I mean, how do you know how to be a senior citizen? It's tough. It's tough being a senior citizen. Jack, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but you've never been where you've been before. You've never been 18 and about to go to college. You've never been 32 with two rambunctious kids. You've never been where you're at. So how do you know what to do? You don't. Get humble and get some people in your life who are going to disciple you with the word of God. Are you with me right here, guys? Yeah, we need to understand we need spiritual moms and spiritual dads. And then the natural order of things is for us to be fruitful and to get into people's lives and become spiritual dads and spiritual moms. And I challenge you this week, get into a study and have some spiritual children. Amen? Our last point, honor God the Father. Turn to Luke chapter 15. One of the most well known of all the parables is the parable of the prodigal son. Jesus says, verse 11, chapter 15 of Luke. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a different country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. 
So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he says, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Does that fire you up or not? I don't care how many times you read this parable. It just stirs you. You know, whenever I find someone that's fallen away or someone that's lost their first love, this is the first scripture that I study with them. Not so much to focus in on the fact that they're a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter. But very often people have fallen away because they've lost sight of who God is. And this particular parable just reveals who God is in a very heart-wrenching and heartwarming way. First of all, we read at the very beginning that the youngest son says, Hey, just give me my inheritance. I mean, just pure, unadulterated selfishness. And he just leaves, totally unappreciated. It just broke the heart of the dad. And he does all sorts of things when he leaves his father. But the most awesome thing is when the prodigal comes home. And look what the Bible says right here in verse 20. It says, while the prodigal son was still a long ways off, his father saw him. What's that say? What's this say about God? Is that God is waiting for fallaways to come home. And he's been watching And he can't get a hold of you because you've decided not to be with God. You see, a relationship is a two-way thing. In dating, and brothers, you need to take notes here. If the girl doesn't want to go out with you, it's not going to happen. Seems profound, but it's the truth. There's not going to be a relationship there. So it is with God. God wants a relationship. How much he sent his one and only son to die for us. But if you turn your back and you live your life the way you want to, then there's no relationship with God. Not because God doesn't want it. It's because you've turned away from God. But the moment you say, I want a relationship with God, God's there. He's been watching and he's been waiting. And even though you're still alone, ways off God sees you now look at the next thing it says he was filled with compassion you know if you fill a glass with water it's got nothing but water in it if a person or God is filled with compassion it means it's got nothing but compassion in him There's no anger. There's no lightning bolts ready to be fired at you. That's sometimes how we we are. We we don't know God. We don't understand that he wants this relationship with us. And the Bible says, while the prodigal was still a long ways off, his heart is filled with compassion. All that's in God is just compassion. And then the Bible says, he runs to his son. He's going to come after you. You know, time after time, People have left the Lord, and they they become lonely, depressed, and so down, and they just pray, God, I don't know what, what to do. I just don't know where to turn. Next day, there's a Christian. God sends them right on in. And the Bible says, when he gets you, he throws his arms around you, and he kisses you, and then the Bible says, That the father says, get a robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger, signifying, of course, that you're God's son. And then he says, hey, yep, let's kill the fat calf. Let's get some steaks grilling. It's Father's Day. Let's celebrate right here. Are you with me right here? See, that's how how fired up God is. 
You know, this morning I, I was blessed to get several texts wishing, wishing me Happy Father's Day. But the most moving one was from that young lady, or actually she's, she's a woman in her 30s, uh, who'd become a Christian, both her and her husband. I'd reached out to them. Her husband was a denominational minister and then became a true disciple. And she was baptized. They were in the ministry here. They even planted the church in Guatemala. But he committed adultery, and he left the Lord. And then out of her bitterness and sadness, she left the Lord. And, of course, I, I told the story a couple weeks ago about I was on Facebook, and Jolie shows up on Facebook. <laughs> Meets me and Elena there with her new husband in Chicago. She's now studying the Bible with Teresa to get restored. Her new husband has already done the word study. Is that awesome? He's all fired up. They're inviting people. They're trying to start a remnant group where they live there in Michigan. And she just texted me this morning, and she simply said, uh, since the day of my baptism, you became my spiritual father. Thank you for accepting back your prodigal daughter. Man, I just... just I mean, what... What a great Father's Day to be able to have words like that. You know, I know even today we've got people that have fallen away. God wants a relationship with you. We've got disciples that are, that are members of the church here. Oh, you're still coming to church, but you've lost your first love. But God wants you back. But you've got to give yourself back. Yeah, get open with your life and get open with God. Well, what's so important about getting open with God? Well, let's look at that. Romans chapter 8. In verse 13, Paul writes to the church at Rome. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Does that fire you up right there? For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. You know, right here, he says, because you are the sons of God, you can call God Father. Now, for most Americans, that just kind of goes over our heads. The Jews of the Old Testament, they called God the Creator God. They called him Lord, and they called him Master. Father was not in the vernacular. It took Jesus coming to reveal the Father. And he says, now, when you become sons, and it's going to be awesome to watch Julia baptized today. Because when she's baptized, because she's made Jesus the Lord of her life, because she's repented of her sins and become a disciple, when she comes out of the waters of baptism, all of her sins are going to be forgiven. She'll receive the Holy Spirit. So now there's nothing blocking her with God. And she has the Spirit of God within her. And so she can call God Father. But the actual term right here, Abba, is in Aramaic. And it really carries with it a, a closeness, a, just a, a real tightness with God. And it might be better translated like Daddy. See, a lot of us have been raised kind of formally. And so we call God Father, dear Father in heaven. But God says, no, if, if you really understand the sonship, it's more Dad, Daddy in heaven. That's, that's how we pray. That's the kind of relationship the Bible says we have with God once we become his sons and daughters. Is that far you want up? Now, it gets even better. Verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches the heart knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. This is so powerful. You know, there are times in the life of a Christian where we're hurting, we're down, we've been battened down by Satan. So many, quote, negative things have happened to us. We don't even know what to pray for. Sometimes we don't even think we have the strength to pray. 
And the Bible says that it's this time you just get down on your knees and you can just know that through the Spirit of God, your groanings, your hurt, will be delivered by the Spirit to the heart of God. And God will know what you're thinking and he will answer your prayers, the Bible says right here, according to his will. Does that fire you on up or not? You know, one of the things that uh, is very powerful is to be able to talk with your child when they're young. And they call you dad. means a lot. But you know, it means even more when they get older. And there's still that bond of closeness there. You know what I'm talking about? And that should be how it should be for all of us that are, quote, aging in Christ. In verse 28, it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. See, that is what we cling on to. All the things that are hurtful, that are painful in this life, God knows about. And when we pray about it, God is going to answer our prayers according to his word and his will. You know, in many families, there seems to be one kid that is always the kid that's going to the hospital. We have three kids. Sean, he was one that was always going to the hospital. I mean, even senior high school, his appendix bursts, and he's in the hospital nine days, almost died. And Sean, you know, actually pretty lean guy, he lost 25 pounds. Looked like Gandhi when he first got up. But the time I most remember with Sean was when he was diagnosed about three years old as having congenital scoliosis. Now, a lot of young women have scoliosis, a curvature of the spine. It's not the same thing. This is, this is a, a congenital birth defect. Sean was born with three extra, what they call, half vertebrae. So you know your vertebrae are stacked on top of each other, normal people. But Sean was born with an extra vertebrae stuck here, an extra one here, an extra one here, and it caused a curving and a twisting. And what this does in most cases is that it injures the internal organs even to the point of a kid dying very, very young. I still remember, Elaine and I went to the hospital. We got the news from the doctor. Elaine is crying all the way home. It was Bible talk night. And I, and I don't know, I couldn't think of any other scripture but John 9. It says, these things happened that the glory of God may be revealed. And sometimes... You need to give a Bible talk to yourself. You know what I mean? That was one of those nights. That was for me. Shh. And I remember we had to, in order for Sean to get his operation, he was going to have to go into a body cast for six months. So we had to, before the operation, we had to get a new car that would hold him because he had to lie down in the car. And it was a very, very serious operation. And he was in the hospital there at Boston Children's Hospital many days. But it was, it was so cool. I, I, was, I, I was so proud of him. He was such a cheerful little kid. I mean, all the nurses would tell me every night he was singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic to all the little kids in the, in the recovery room right there. Now, he's on morphine, but still, you know. <laughs> and I remember for tea time, I'd always take out Sean, and what he loved was McDonald's French fries. So I remember sneaking in some McDonald's French fries, you know, to him, you know, rescuing him there. And I remember us watching the Celtics win an NBA championship. That was when I was a Celtic fan. I, I've repented. I'm with the Lakers. Amen. You know what I mean? Yeah. Many years later, we moved to L.A. when Sean was about seven. It's a time, you know, when, when kids get into sports. And Olivia was doing her dancing and her gymnastics. Aries was doing his basketball and all this stuff. And, and Sean was told because of his operation where they had to take marrow out of his hip and literally freeze the lower part of his whole back. He says, you can never do contact sports. And contact sports not, were not just football, but included basketball and baseball. I said, well, son, and I drew him a little diagram of his back. I said, here's what's happened to you. 
God's in control. And so I, I can only think of three sports you can do. There's swimming, there's golf, and there's tennis. Which one do you want to do? Um, let's do tennis, Dad. So I remember just looking at the yellow pages, and we started tennis. And we started playing a little bit and played for a while. After a while, the kids were doing so many activities. I was drowning trying to get them to everything. I said, okay, guys, I got a battle plan. How about we all do the same thing at the same time? <laughs> uh, let's try it for six months. So we all tried tennis. And we got this instructor, a Jewish guy named Danny Saltz, who was going through a divorce. And he saw the kids, talked to Elaine and myself, and we started studying the Bible. Six months later, Danny was baptized. Well, why? Well, because Sean was in so much pain and had a birth defect that he was limited to swimming, golf, and he chose tennis. A month later, since Olivia was playing, a top woman professional, Abigail Valena, was baptized. Now, Danny was number 88 in the world. Abigail was number 300 in the world. A year later, another tennis pro, who was a college All-American, Terry Davis, was baptized. In 1995, we took the kids to Johannesburg, South Africa. And there I was privileged to be able to give a special award to Mandela. But we had a leadership meeting, and, and during the meeting, the kids wanted to go out and practice tennis. Danny was there. And while they were practicing, Sean met this South African guy that was a junior tennis player in the 18s. And they hit it off. His name was Tabuku. Well, Sean said, hey, my dad's preaching in Soweto this coming Sunday. You got to come. Well, Tabuku brought his parents, and all three of them were baptized in two weeks. A year later, Sean had gotten pretty good by this time. And he was out there having the match of his life. Trust me, he was playing above his head. And this one father was watching him. He goes, man, how does he do it? That's, the kid's incredible. And he's so well behaved. Go, well, amen. <laughs> Glad it's a good day. <laughs> and so I invited Bruce and Patty Aiken out, and they were baptized a month later. In 1999, another tennis pro that Sean worked with, Andre and his wife Jamie Kerr, were baptized into Christ. And then later in 2005, the captain of Eric's team at Stanford, Carter Morris, was baptized into Christ. But the most memorable baptism from our tennis was Sean's best friend. He played tennis with him at the academy. His name was Chris Dennis. He's a worldly kind of kid, but he and Sean became best friends. And the more he hung around Sean, he began to change. He finally came out to church, started studying. I'll never forget his baptism. Because I remember Sean and a young man named Steve took him down into the water there at Manhattan Beach. And it was a rough day. And so they were just ready to baptize Chris. They're going back, and this gigantic wave just comes over and baptizes all three. You couldn't see any of them. <laughs> and I'll never forget talking to Son. I said, well, Son, that was a unique baptism. I've never seen God personally baptize somebody. <laughs> You know, that, that, the tennis guided us so much. I remember one of the big sectionals with Eric. It was a big time for him. I mean, he's something like 11 years old, and it's a big sectional. He won the first round. He was so fired up. And then he totally got toasted in the second round. And I remember him coming off the court just crying. He says, Dad, where were you? He says, you're around when I'm winning. And you weren't there. I looked over, and you weren't there. It was like hitting me, you know. I said, son, I was there. I gave up my seat for the mom of the guy that beat you. Oh, sorry, Dad. <laughs> you know, it reminded me that so often when things go bad, we don't see our father. I keep in my billfold a little poem that always reminds me 
that God is there, particularly in tough times. It's called footprints. It says, one night, a man had a dream. He dreamed he was walking along the beach with the Lord. Across the sky flashed scenes from his life. For each scene, he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to him and the other to the Lord. When the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand. He noticed that at many times along the path of his life, there was only one set of footprints. He also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times in his life. This really bothered him, and, and he questioned the Lord about it. Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I've noticed that during the most troublesome times in my life, there's only one set of footprints. I don't understand why, when I needed you the most, you would leave me. The Lord replied, my son, my precious child, I love you and would never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Even as a disciple, you're going to have hard times. And you're going to be tempted to think, where's God? right then that he's carrying you I hope that today you'll make it a point to honor your earthly father be it a natural father or an adopted father or a stepfather I pray that today you'll go out of your way to honor your father in the gospel remembering that you need to become a father in the gospel or a mom in the gospel but most of all today, I pray that you'll take some special time and honor your Father in heaven. Thank you, and God bless.